Hello everybody, this is Pastor Graham Field from Kingsway Church in Wamban. We're doing church differently. As we carry on with our cyber church, we are carrying on with our study in the book of Daniel, the wonderful book of Daniel. We have come to part four. And the title of part four is Don't Mess With God. Tell it as it is. Don't mess with God. Tell it as it is. In the story of Daniel, the Jewish people were undergoing a cultural transformation, having been taken as servant people to the kingdom of Babylon. They were under a process of being cut off from their faith with the God of Israel and the customs which went along with that faith in order to bow down and worship foreign gods and live a life that was contradictory to the will and purposes of God. As such, we have compared the days of Daniel to our days today, and we have taken as our key verse Psalm 137 verses 1 to 4, where the lament of the people said, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There we hung our harps, there our captors asked us for songs of joy, and they said, Sing to us one of the songs of Zion. And we said, How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a strange land? And that is the question. How do we maintain a real and vibrant relationship with God in a world that is increasingly hostile through all that we believe? Now, as I've said, I can't read every word or comment on every verse in the book of Daniel because the timing of the broadcast will not allow that. But I do encourage you, as you study with me, to read all the verses of the chapters that we deal with. So, chapter 4, and we're going to read most of it. This is an incredible chapter, actually, because it starts off with the prayer or the words of Nebuchadnezzar himself. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Wow, that's something from somebody who in the first chapters of Daniel thought himself to be God. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace content and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. And as I was lying in my bed, the image and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came to my presence and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. And I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the only God is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream, interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top reached the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful. Its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it the beasts of the field found shelter, and the birds of the air lived in its branches. From it every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in my bed, I looked 
and there before me was a messenger a holy one coming down from heaven and he called in a loud voice cut down the tree and trim off its branches strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches but let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field let them be drenched with the dew of heaven and let them live with the animals among the plants of the earth let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him the decision is announced by the messengers the holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the most high is sovereign over the kingdom of men and gives them to any one he wishes to and sets over them the lowliest of men this is the dream that I, Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can, because the Spirit of the Holy God is in you. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew very large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter the beast of the field and having nesting places in its branches for the birds of the air you O king are that tree and he goes on to say how great the king has become uh, and and uh, that the message that comes is that he's going to be cut down this is the interpretation, O king. The Most High has issued against my lord the king. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. This is verse 24. Seven times will pass by for you until the, uh, you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes the command to leave the stump of the tree with its root means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules therefore o king be pleased to accept my advice renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness may be kind to the oppressed that it may uh, 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 and, and your uh, sorry repent from your sins and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed it may be then that your prosperity will continue Wow, this is extraordinary. It presents as a testimony from Nebuchadnezzar. It's amazing to think that this man is now so humble to make such a declaration of mental illness. Even more amazing is the form of mental illness which is described. It's not unknown, but it's extremely rare that a person feels their body changing into that of an animal and behaves like an animal. It's called porphyria. And it, it's, it's a terrible, terrible thing. And it's what Nebuchadnezzar went through. So, what does it mean to us in trying to make a, a meaningful, effective, vibrant stand for Jesus in these dark days in which we live? But what do we know about Nebuchadnezzar so far? Well, in chapter 1, verse 18, when he first interviews uh, Daniel and Sh uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that um, he's so impressed by them that he gives them the best jobs and the highest jobs in the land. In chapter 2, when he has his dream of the metallic image, <clears throat> he calls everybody except Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, as if he's forgotten about them. Somebody has to go and find them and call them to, to the king. He doesn't think of them at all. And in the end of, of chapter 2, we find that uh, in verse 46, that King, ne king Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honour and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. 
And the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. That's a conversion. That's Nebuchadnezzar worshipping the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. But in chapter 3, what happened to this worship of the God of Daniel? Where he makes his own image and says, everybody must bow down and worship me. But at the end of it all, when Daniel comes out, when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego come out of the fiery furnace, uh, he says, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angels and rescued his servants. And he said nobody, including himself, can say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Another conversion. Honouring the God of Israel. So what we've got with Nebuchadnezzar is a pattern of turning to God and turning away from God. Turning back to God when something phenomenal happens and turning away from God. And that seems to be the pattern of his life. Then we come to the dream of chapter 4. After all he had been through, we come to an outburst of pride and arrogance. And we pick this up in verse 28 of chapter 4. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. He said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence, but by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and live with wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times or seven years you will, will pass by you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives to them anything he wishes. And so at the end of the time, verse 34, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honoured and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my sanity was restored. My honour and splendour were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisers and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. What a conversion! What a change! But what a story in order to get there. Daniel is scared to death to interpret this dream of this tree which reaches to the sky, fills the whole earth, and says, Nebuchadnezzar, that's you. And you're going to be cut down. And you're going to be left in the field. And you'll live like an animal for seven years. And then when you repent, God will restore to you the things that you lost. What's the message for people trying to give their faith, make a stand for their faith, in an increasingly hostile world. Number one, don't mess with God. This is not an age to mess with God. And the second part of the message is tell it as it is. Tell it as it is. First of all then, don't mess with God. We in the midst of a generation of people who, who do not take God seriously, that is if they take God at all, Many come and go from the altars of our churches with alarming frequency. There are tears of repentance one day and then nothing. It's not they have fallen out with anybody or anyone happened, anything happened to their dislike. They just went. They still profess belief, but they display no evidence of faith. 
It goes on until the next crisis or twinge of conscience, and so the cycle repeats. It doesn't matter what amazing spiritual experience they have, it just filters out like water in a bucket with a hole in it. Just like Nebuchadnezzar. Amazing, I mean absolutely incredible, encounters with God, confessions, prostrating himself on the floor, repentance, and then it's all gone. He's building another image, and, and the whole thing is reversed. Some people have come into our churches and you think you've got the next Billy Graham or Reinhard Bonker on your hands. But in a few weeks they've gone and it's as if they never came. What is this? What's happening? What's happening? What was happening here in Babylon? These incredible demonstrations of God's power. Yet Nebuchadnezzar was in and out of faith. And so today with a legacy of faith, with a legacy of the outpouring of God's Spirit. We have people who just don't take God seriously. I wonder if we become over-friendly in our presentation of the Gospel. We are trying to make it too easy. We have certainly made every effort to make our churches as friendly and as comfortable as possible and I can't argue with that. that. That's got to be the right thing to do. We've also made the gospel as easy to understand as we can. We've got it in King James English. We've got it in 20th century English. We've got it in black country English. We've got it in every dialect uh, that we can possibly think of to make the Bible easy to understand. And I've done it a thousand times. You've probably heard it just as many. Bow your head, raise your hand. I don't wish to embarrass you. Say this prayer after me. Have we made it all too easy? For the last days. We have become excruciatingly tolerant of human behaviour. Drunks, drink, promiscuity, affairs lies, non-employment, debt. God will understand. And these things can be done again and again and again. And God will still understand. We flatly refuse to do anything that is measurable and visible, like read our Bible or pray or be baptised. Everything is secret, covered, if in fact anything happens at all. And we wonder why people mess with God. What are we to do? We are to make a clear stand for God. If you're in, you're in. Stop treating the door to the kingdom of God like a revolving door where kids pass the time pushing the thing round and round. What example do we set? Do we take God seriously? Do we live in the fear of God? If we don't, we can't expect anybody else to. So the last part. Tell it as it is. Even Daniel require, it required encouragement here. If only I was talking to your enemies, he said. This would be easy to say. But I'm talking to you, O King. Now, today we recoil in horror at the seeming abrupt and graceless nature of Pentecostal pioneers. And further back, the Puritans. Puritans who made a woman walk down the street with a big letter A on her dress because she had committed adultery, shaven head and tarred and feathered. We'd say that wasn't Christian. Well, it wasn't. But I would say what happened to the man involved. If he had an A on his shirt and was shaven and tarred and feathered, then at least it would be equal. But it never was. We were made to wear our hats and our suit and be at church on time to pay our tithes and be involved and behave ourselves at all times. Today we call it legalism and judgmentalism and have nothing to do with it, and quite rightly. But at least we knew where we stood. And the world knew where we stood. Today we are so terrified of offending someone, we now tolerate, or, tolerate almost anything. And if you dare raise a matter 
of conscience or ethics. They're gone. There's a thing been on Facebook recently by various people, one of these sort of things you paste and you cut and paste, which says words to this effect, don't judge me unless you can walk on water. Now that sounds right in the first place, but it's not right. If by judge you mean condemn, then okay, that's fine. Only the one who walks on water will condemn. But he will condemn the unrighteous. But what is meant is that if you point out the error of my ways, you can't do that unless you can walk on water. And that's nonsense. Because if the error of someone's ways and the effect that is having on them and the people around them, if we can't put that, if we can't weigh that up and say, this doesn't measure to the word of God, and if we can't say that, then we've got anarchy on our hands. That that statement, don't judge me unless you can walk on water, means you can't say anything to me. I can do whatever I like. In the last days, my dear friend, you cannot. These are the last days. And the message of this study is two phrases. Don't mess with God. And I say that with a pleading heart. I say that from the bottom of my heart. Don't mess with God. And when you have to say something, tell it as it is. Tell it as it is. Mark 16, 16 says, He who believes and is baptised will be saved. Not he who believes only, but he who has an inner experience and an outer profession. You're not saved. If there is not an inner and an outer declaration. Matthew 24, 13, He who stands firm to the end will be saved, not the one who is in and out and up and down, serving God, not serving God, promising but not fulfilling. Such a one is not saved. My friend, that's how it is. That's the gospel. If Jesus is worth saving, serving today, he's worth serving tomorrow. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In a way, I repeat what Daniel said. I wish I was talking to your enemies. But I'm talking to you. And I'm talking to myself. First of all. Making our faith meaningful. Making a vibrant stand for Jesus in days of darkness. Don't mess with God. Tell it as it is. Thank you for listening today. I trust that part four of our study of Daniel has been a blessing to you. I look forward to you joining me in part five. God bless.